why don't you open it up for us and describe exactly what happened, who the patient was, what your thoughts were when you first got to the patient? Absolutely. So we were actually dispatched to this call pretty early in the morning. It was probably around 4 a.m. So we got dispatched to a motor vehicle accident and it was a single motor vehicle accident. The patient was found in his truck alone. Um, there appeared to be no other patients on scene. It looked like he had driven his truck through a fence. Um, so initially when we heard the call go out, we thought it was maybe possibly intoxication of some sort just due to the hour of the call and um, just the nature of the call. We thought, okay, probably an intoxicated patient but it became very apparent when we arrived on scene, there was no evidence of any drinking, drugs, anything like that. The patient was elderly um, and he was extremely disoriented. There was very minimal damage to the vehicle itself. So um, we weren't worried too much that we had a lot of traumatic to worry about. But once the patient started to become a little more oriented and was able to tell us what was going on, he explained that he had woken up probably around 3 a.m. that morning. He had some chest pain and he decided to just brew himself a coffee and hopefully it would all go away, right? So he brewed himself a coffee, took a big old drink and got on the road and said he was going to go to work. And I believe he was involved somehow with the agricultural community. So he was out going to a farm or something like that. Um, and then I assume that he lost consciousness at one point and ended up in a field. So when we arrived on scene, like I said, very, very, there really weren't any injuries. There was a slight bit of dried blood by his mouth no airbag deployment, very minimal damage to the vehicle. Um, and we asked him, you know, how's your chest pain now? He said, oh, it's probably about a four out of 10. And uh, we just, we had time while we were waiting on the ambulance to get out into the field. We had to walk out there to him. Um, we got an EKG and that's what you saw, so. Well, I'm not sure about you, but every time I have chest pain at three in the morning, I always make myself a cup of coffee. You know, it's a it's a vasodilator, right? Right. It's <laughs> so do you remember what time it was uh, a weekday, a Monday morning by any chance? Um, it could have been. It, it seems like ago. about four years ago, but, but it seems like it was early in the week and it was about 4 a.m. in the morning. You know, the, the, the greatest number of heart attacks happen sometime between 6 a.m. and 12 p.m. on Monday morning. So uh, it really is, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, I think. So let me ask you something. Um, you get to this patient, and what you're telling me is you saw an MVA with a patient who had chest pain. So in my mind, you know, in emergency medicine, we, always, we talk about the difference between which came first. Was it, you know, was it the crash that caused chest pain? traumatic chest pain, or was it a heart attack or some sort of a cardiac event that resulted in the patient crashing? Uh, what was your thinking about the way this patient was in, the way you saw him first? Initial thoughts before I, of course, got more of the story was it was a trauma, possibly intoxication. But once I kind of put all the details together and the patient was saying, oh, you know, kind of downplaying the trauma had that morning, I thought, I bet he lost consciousness because he had a heart attack. And then we got the EKG and the level of ST elevation. Like, this has been going on for a little bit. Plus the Q waves and the anterior leaks, Correct. right? So, um, yeah. And so what was it that made you get an ECG right away? Well, one, we had time. We were waiting on that ambulance to get out there. Mm -hmm. And just the, the complaints of chest pain and... There were no other, like I said, intoxicants or anything like that, you know, were a consideration. I thought, I think this is either of a cardiac origin, and I didn't rule out diabetic origin either. Mm -hmm. You know, we ended up, you know, getting a blood sugar, and that was all normal. That's what kind of pointed me in that direction. Right. Terrific. Let's get to the ECG. You get the ECG. You see the 12 lead that we posted yesterday. You and I posted it. And um, what were your thoughts? First impression when you saw that cardiogram. Well, I actually... I had another, um, I had a student with me. He was a paramedic student. So first thing I did, I thought, 
that's a big old stimmy. So I just immediately handed it to him and said, what do you see? And he said, that's a stimmy. And then I took a look, and I saw, the, you know, I saw the anterior elevation, I saw the septal elevation, I saw reciprocal depression. And that, you know, in a fixed mind, we don't have access to troponin levels and things of that nature. So that reciprocal depression too is just further confirmation. Okay, this is a cardiac event, a big one. Right, and you're spot on. Because the reason it is is because it's a big answer am I. Now, folks, you know, anterior MIs can be divided up in different ways. We think about um, the anterior wall having septal, a septal portion with the septal leads being B1 and B2, the anterior leads being B3 and B4, and then the lateral leads, right, being the being B5 and B6, but you can have a combination of things too. And this patient, um, I don't have the ECG in front of me, but uh, it looked like there are elevations in V1, V2, uh, yeah, V1, V2, and somewhere in V3, and also in ABR, right? Yeah. Uh, and depressions, reciprocal depressions in the inferior and lateral leads. That really fit the pattern of a anteroseptal MI or septal MI. Um, and the reason why this is important is because inferior MIs are so incredibly bad, much worse than uh, than inferior MIs in terms of hospital mortality, overall mortality. But from an EMS standpoint, it is particularly important because inferior MIs are far greater to cause arrhythmias early in the first day. We talked about the golden hour, right? Uh, last week, and that golden hour is really applicable to anterior MIs because that's when all the the ventricular dysrhythmias occur, right? So, did he have any? Did he have any dysrhythmias uh, in your care uh, while while on the uh, on the ambulance? There, aside from PVCs and ACs, there there were no deadly arrhythmias that I noticed. In the STEMI itself, right. Was deadly enough. <laughs> was deadly enough. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And how long was your transport time? Um, it was about 15 minutes. We had enough time to get an IV. Um, oxygen levels were above 94%, so I don't believe we added supplemental oxygen, but we did aspirin, two rounds of nitrate, one round uh, or 50 micrograms of fentanyl. So. Well, it sounds like your care was absolutely correct. Uh, that's exactly what I'd want you to do for me. Um, and uh, that's great, great job. Any any follow-up, any outcome, known outcome of how he did, Stacey? So not a whole lot of attention because in my area, very rural area, we don't have cath lab. So he was immediately flown out once we arrived at the hospital and sent out, um, although we did hear back that he made it. That's about the extent of what we heard. Good enough, right? He made it. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Very anterior MIs, they are the big ones, uh, for sure. And the reason for that is that that's where all the, the heart muscle is, right? The inferior wall is a, sort of from the bottom of the heart to the left ventricle. Uh, it's not part of the squeezing mechanism as much as the anterior lateral wall. So when the anterior wall takes a hit, uh, EF goes down, patients are far more likely, like three times more likely to go to heart failure long term. So it's a huge deal for the patient's overall outcome. And uh, I think one thing we've got to mention here is the finding of uh, ST elevations in ABR when you see an anterior MI. And, um, you know, there is some evidence that when you see ABR being elevated, elevated uh, in conjunction with B1, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a bad prognosticator of, um, of uh, MACE in 30 days. So these patients tend to do a lot worse. So your patient actually had that. If you go back and take a look at the ECG folks, you'll see that AVR is actually elevated along with B1. So take a look at that and be careful about that finding in the presence of an anterior MI. Now, there are very many, there are many other reasons for isolated AVR elevations, right? We know that. Um, but when you see it in the presence of an acute MI, uh, it portends a significantly worse prognosis in 30 days. So that's an important um, fact too. I think just keep in mind when you take care of such patients. Absolutely. Super interesting. All right, Stacey, thanks so much for joining and we'll do more cases, I hope, in the future. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, folks. Bye for now. We'll see you soon.